Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone welcome to the course on medical biomaterials we are going to talk about uh, sterilization and device failure. Sterilizing a uh, material is very very important whether it is uh, for a short duration like your uh, catheter or uh, medium duration like uh, cardiovascular stents or even uh, total knee replacement um, joints and so on actually. Okay. So, if devices do not get sterilized properly infection is being carried inside which may lead to biofilm formation and finally, rejection of the material and the, the material has to be explanted out. So, sterilization is extremely important. Then uh, we are talking about uh, a biomaterial which is made up of metal or a polymer or a ceramic. So, we cannot follow the same sterilization procedure uh, because a polymer might not uh, be able to withstand a very high temperatures whereas, metal will be able to withstand high temperatures. So, we need to have different strategies. So, we are going to look at uh, some of those uh, in this particular class. So, sterilization of implants. So, materials implanted in the body or human or an animal must be sterile to prevent infection which can lead to serious illness or death to the host number one. Number two, if we are using expensive instruments, we do not want to throw them out. So, we would like to use them recycle them. So, we need to sterilize. So, whereas, uh, if it is very cheap uh, instruments uh, like uh, your catheters or even uh, your uh, syringes or needles uh, it can be disposed, but very expensive instruments of course, you need to sterilize. Okay, um, these two are good uh, references uh, to have a look at if you are looking at uh, materials in medicine and uh, is issues related to sterilization have a look at these two. Okay, so, we need to have a validated process because every time we cannot use an ad hoc sterilization procedure. So, it has to be repeater, it should be rendered a product free of all forms of viable microorganism. Okay. So, sterilization uh, is has to be a validated process. Uh, disinfection on the other hand, destruction of pathogenic and other kinds of microorganisms by thermal or chemical means. So, it destroys most recognized pathogenic microorganism, but not necessarily all microbial forms like spores because spores may be able to last longer and they may be able to withstand high temperature. So, it might kill many, but not completely. Okay. So, it depends upon uh, the threshold, the lower limit. Uh, so, if you look at categories of medical devices, one is called the critical, semi critical, non critical. What is this critical? like uh, sterile tissue or vascular system, surgical instruments, cardiac, urinary catheters, implants, they are supposed to be crit critical systems. Whereas, um, semi critical materials which are in contact with the mucous membranes or non intact skin like endoscopes, respiratory therapy, anesthetic equipment, diaphragm rings and then non critical will be mostly um, bed pans, blood pressure cuffs crutches. So, they just come temporarily in contact and generally it will not be um, in contact with the body fluids much. So, they can be called non-critical. So, the critical is that which is going to be in contact with the body fluids may be kept inside uh, the human system okay, that is the critical one. So, there is something called sterility assurance level this is the generally accepted minimum sterility for implants generally it is called a probability of 10 power minus 6 that means 1 in a million that the implant will remain non sterile 1 in a million. Okay. So, there is still possibility of 1 in a million. So, if a hospital conducts 1 million um, surgeries if you are following this uh, SAL sterility assurance level then the chances are there could be one in a million uh, which will not uh, have a sterile biomaterial. So, how do you determine this uh, sterility assurance? 
So, we determine the number of viable microorganisms on an implant before sterilization. Okay. That means, you take 10 or 30 samples, then we shake it, sonic it, wash off the microorganisms from the implant into the fluid, then determine uh, the colony count, it is called number of colony by growing them in agar, incubating it over 24 hours. These are very standard procedures. Um, then after that you follow your um, sterilization procedure and again repeat the whole thing and see what is the effect of sterilization on the microbial kill rate. Suppose I am looking at time, should I do for 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes sterilization. So, I can do at different times and see what is the uh, percentage of organisms that got killed. So, I plot a graph and then from there I decide what should be the time necessary for me to um, do the sterilization process. Okay. So, that is optimizing with respect to time. Same thing we can do with temperature also. Suppose, uh, I want to think about should I use 80 degrees, 90 degrees, 100 degrees. So, I can do the sterilization at various temperatures <coughs> and then see what is the killing rate and then I decide on what should be my optimum temperature. Okay. Uh, the easiest is steam sterilization. This is the oldest method, safest method, it is very, very cheap. That means, uh, we do it for about uh, 15 to 30 minutes, 15 psi. <coughs> so, we can reach about 120 degrees. It kills microorganisms by destroying metabolic and structural components essential for the replication. So, advantages they are very efficient, fast, simple, no, it does not leave any toxic residues. Disadvantages, of course, uh, um, we cannot use it for packaging material, we cannot use it for polymers, adhesives, <coughs> materials which may melt or soften. That means, if uh, Tg is less than 121, then uh, the material will get deformed if I raise the temperature to 121C. Um, if it is a hydrophilic material, it may absorb moisture. If it is a biodegradable or decomposing material like polyesters, then steam sterilization is not a good method. But it is the cheapest and it has been, of course, we cannot uh, do very prolonged heating because uh, the moisture of the steam sterilization process. Uh, may uh, damage the material. So, we may have to go to chemical sterilization, radiation sterilization, um, which can be done on heat sensitive or moisture sensitive materials. Okay, they are slightly more expensive. Radiation, what do you do? We use uh, cobalt 60 gamma rays. So, it produces ionizing radiation of cobalt 60 isotope source. Okay. Uh, then, the dose, uh, sufficient dose is uh, focused on the material, uh, then the material becomes sterile. Okay? That is called the radiation approach. Another approach is ethylene oxide, this also has been there for a long time. Ethylene oxide is a gas, okay? uh, it disrupts the DNA uh, and it can be used for all materials. Of course, it takes long time, precondition, temperature, humidity, aeration um, is a problem, but then uh, if you are going to aerate it, then polymers, if they are present, they may start absorbing more air, okay. that is a big problem actually. So, ethylene oxide generally uh, 50 to 60 degrees centigrade, it kills microorganism including spores by alkylating proteins and DNA. So, they should have a direct contact with the microorganism okay, because ethylene oxide will directly um, get in contact on uh, with the microorganism and then do the job unlike the uh, normal autoclaving approach. So, this is very, very um, widely used as it says half the medical devices are sterilized using ethylene oxide. Uh, heat or moisture sensitive material can be done with this, um, compatible with a wide range of implant material, packaging material, stucho, uh, intraocular lenses, ligaments, tendons, heart valves, vascular grafts. So, it is very effective, high penetration because it is a gas, it penetrates through the interstices and kills, compatible. Disadvantage, it takes much longer time, 16 to 24 hours, whereas uh, steam sterilization we are talking in terms of 30 minutes. Uh, it is extremely reactive and flammable, so we need to handle with care, can leave toxic residues, so we need to aerate it completely to remove them. Um, it, so, it has lot of physical and health hazards, contact with the eyes, inhalation should be avoided, 
by the person who is um, doing this type of uh, sterilization. Um, if you look at uh, the gamma radiation cobalt widely used for medical products against sutures, drapes, metallic bone implants, knee heap prosthesis, syringes, wide range of materials are compatible with the radiation, polymers like polyesters, polyethylene, polystyrene, polysulfones, polycarbonate, of course fluoropolymers like PTFE is not compatible. It is a simple rapid effective can be uh, controlled by proper dosing. Large and small materials can be done, cost effective, not toxic, but it is very expensive because we need to have a cobalt 60 source and we need to get a lot of uh, approval from the atomic energy for handling uh, cobalt 60. Uh, there will be continual decay of the isotope, so we need to do a very long processing time so that all the cobalt 60 is completely decayed out. So other high temperature techniques, dry heat. We can go up to 160, it is not a steam sterilization, that means we do not use steam, it is just dry heat, 2 hours limited applications, oils, petroleum products, bulk powders that steam and ethylene oxide can penetrate because if I am having these uh, steam that is water can penetrate into this or even uh, ethylene oxide can penetrate into this. So that is called a dry sterilization, temperatures are high and uh, it is a limited application. Then of course, we have low temperature methods like hydrogen peroxide plasma around 45 to 50. Um, of course, it is expensive because we are using plasma. So, it be, this is a method good between autoclave and high temperature sterilization okay? uh, because ethylene oxide may leave toxic residuals, so high temperature is better. Uh, quickly sterilize most medical instruments material without leaving any toxic material because hydrogen peroxide is a gas. It is activated to create a reactive plasma or vapor. Uh, the time is also less 45 to 70 minutes. Um, hydrogen peroxide of course, it is a very good antioxidant and it is a very good antimicrobial agent. So, it can kill many spores also. So, you can use this for heat sensitive material equipment such as endoscopic equipment that is called hydrogen peroxide plasma method. Um, then we have sterile processing systems um, where we are using 50 to 56 degrees 30 minutes. Um, we use um, per acetic acid okay? where per acetic acid as you know is an oxidant and a disinfectant. So, we can use this. Um, so, it can kill microorganisms at low temperatures. Okay, so, we do not have to go to 100, 100 in autoclave or 150 or something. So, it reacts with most cell cellular components to destroy. So, it is a sterile processing system using per acetic acid. So, what we do is we have to immerse the material or the instrument okay? and uh, if the material cannot be immersed then we cannot use this method and we do not need to have a packaging for the material also. Okay. So, it has got some disadvantages. Uh, then there is another method where you are using high level disinfectant HLD. This is an alternative to glutaraldehyde because glutaraldehyde also can be used as a sterilizing agent okay. uh, in 12 minutes at room temperature and it is very good even for mycobacteria in, including glutaraldehyde resistance uh, cholini. Okay. So, uh, here you are using high level disinfectant, broad materials compatible, compatibility of, compatibility of glutaraldehyde requires no activation, minimum odor. So, surgical cameras, cleaning and drying before immersion, rinsing with sterile water prior to use and so on actually. This is called a Cydax OPA solution. <coughs> okay, this contains high level of uh, disinfectant. Okay, you can use glutaraldehyde also. Of course, glutaraldehyde after sterilization will give smell, so you need to have it um, uh, left out uh, so that all the glutaraldehyde vapor evaporates. Uh, there are some banned products, I mean, there are some brand products there, brand names uh, for glutaraldehyde, Cydex Plus and Cydex. Okay. So, so Cydex Plus is contains um, 3.4 percent alkaline glutaraldehyde. So, 20 minutes 25 degrees 
um, so we can take in lot of uh, bacteria even tuberculosidal and high level disinfection. The other one is Cydex activated dihaldehyde solution okay. This contains 2.4 percent alkaline glutaraldehyde solution. So, you need to put it for 45 minutes 25 degrees centigrade okay. So, we can use it at a very uh, room temperature that is 20, 25 degrees centigrade and it is got a very high level disinfectant okay. So, these are solution based. We have high concentration of uh, um, sterilizing instrument disinfecting liquid or we can use glutaraldehyde, alkaline glutaraldehyde of two different uh, compositions. These are a liquid based methods, so we can dip the um, material in that. Then hydrogen peroxide in vaporized form for sterilization and then plasma is called a VHP MD series, okay. Cycle time is 2 hours, operating temperature 30 to 40 degrees centigrade. So, we use hydrogen peroxide and as you know hydrogen peroxide is a very good antioxidant, so it can kill and then we use plasma, okay, radio frequency energy. Um, it is very expensive, it uh, of course takes care between steam sterilization and ethylene oxide gas sterilization. Chlorine dioxide, this is a liquid, uh, so this is a liquid based sterilization uh, 25 to 30 degrees 6 hours. So, how do you produce this uh, liquid? Dilute chlorine gas with sodium chloride to form chlorine dioxide gas and this gas is then exposed to the equipment in a sterilizing chamber, okay. So, we have sodium chloride, we have chlorine gas, so they produce this uh, uh, chlorine dioxide and um, your equipment is exposed to this. Of course, uh, uh, material may get corroded because uh, this chlorine dioxide is extremely corrosive, we have oxygen and chlorine, both uh, can corrode uh, uh, metals, okay. Uh, Pre-humidification of chlorine dioxide is also required. So, that means we need to add little bit of moisture into them. So, a uh, lot of different methods. Of course, ozone. Uh, ozone as you know is a very good um, oxidant. So, it can also sterilize. It destroys organic and inorganic matters. Generally, 60 minutes. It is also very corrosive. It may damage moisture sensitive equipment it penetrates membrane cells causing them to explode, okay. Of course, other radiation sterilization, x-ray, e-beam, uh, that is electron beam radiation, high dose of electrons in a narrow beam, uh, it has got very limited penetrating power, less than gamma radiation. Uh, of course, the radiation can change the properties of the material, especially plastic, they may lose some of their um, mechanical properties, okay, even optical properties. X-rays again same penetrating properties as cobalt 60, faster, more flexible, more environmentally friendly is good for penetration. Uh, it also helps in thoroughly treating the surface and interior of a product, okay. Uh, so, large number of methods we saw, uh, we have the uh, steam, <coughs> we have the dry heat, then we have the ethylene oxide which is widely used. And then we have different types of uh, liquids, okay, glutaraldehyde, chlorine dioxide, okay, hydrogen peroxide, um, and then disinfectant, high concentration of disinfectant, where the material is uh, dipped in and so on. But of course, um, the uh, ethylene oxide takes care of 50 percent uh, of uh, the biomaterials that needs to be um, okay, sterilized. Uh, the steam sterilization is cheap method um, that takes care of uh, many of these product. Of course, that is not very suitable if uh, the material is heat sensitive or it starts absorbing moisture. Um, then we may have to go for uh, glutaraldehyde other type of material methods. Um, of course, the smell of glutaraldehyde um, has to go, so it has to be left open for a long time uh, and so on. So, different methods are being practiced. In the area of uh, biomaterial, uh, um, because material before implanted into human or animals needs to be completely sterilized, uh, it should be free from bacterial infection. Okay, so device failures, devices fail. Many many reasons are there for the failure of devices. Okay, um, we saw some of them during the course of uh, our lectures, and um, they could lead to 
uh, either debilitating effect or very serious uh, uh, even death. There have been many examples of uh, um, device related uh, deaths as well as uh, uh, permanent damage to the human. Poor sterilization, of course, we saw that if the sterilization is poor and uh, uh, you have a bacteria entering this, uh, the human system, it could lead into biofilm formation, infection, um, inflammation, finally rejection of the material. Um, failure of electronic controlled instruments, nowadays a lot of electronics is being used, um, your pacemakers, your uh, left um, uh, assisted ventricular devices, okay, um, artificial uh, heart, so many devices and nowadays uh, defibrillator, they all have some electronics into it, there will be um, some controls, okay. Failure of these electronics, that could be one problem. Mechanical failures, like uh, we use catheters, we use sutures, uh, they just break and uh, the flu internal fluid may pop out or infection bacteria may go inside. Um, if you are using a urinary catheter and it breaks because of mechanical, you are going to have uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, body fluids getting mixed up, okay. That is the mechanical failure and of course, uh, uh, diaphragm valves can have uh, mechanical failure um, and so on actually, your, your uh, vascular grafts can have mechanical failure, your dental implants can have mechanical failure, uh, your uh, um, orthodontic um, materials can have mechanical failure. Mechanical failure could include uh, uh, the um, st stress related or it could be compression related or uh, and so on actually. Environmental stress cracking, bimetallic corrosion, stress corrosion. Metals have one big problem, the corrosion, different types of corrosion, bimetallic corrosion, stress corrosion, uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, distribution of um, elements, corrosion um, and so on actually because uh, the body fluids contain lot of uh, uh, inorganic salts, pH conditions are very acidic. So, they are all very easy to be get corroded. So, the corrosion is a big problem especially in orthopedic area as well as in dental area. So, wear, fatigue, like I said diaphragm valves. Uh, joints, knee joints, they may undergo fatigue, wear uh, the um, ball and socket, overload. So, you are putting too much load, so the materials could break uh, or crumble or crack because of overload. Stress shielding, so we have uh, um, stainless steel or titanium implants going parallel to the bone, so most of the load is taken by these metals, so there is a lot of uh, um, the bone. Um, loses its uh, okay, uh, the uh, the load carrying capacity, so stress shielding can happen. Biodegradation. So if you have a uh, uh, polymers, um, they may start uh, degrading because we have uh, enzymes like lipase, esterase inside the body, uh, which may slowly uh, degrade. Of course, we have oxygen also, so there could be oxidation taking place. So polymeric material may start uh, degrading. So, that is uh, a issue. Once it starts slowly degrading, you may lose its mechanical uh, strength, it may lose, uh, lose uh, other properties. Absence of osteointegration. So, if you have material uh, which do not integrate, so they will remain separately from rest, rest of the surrounding, um, of course, uh, it may, they, they may loosen out. This can happen in uh, teeth, this can happen in uh, uh, the orthopedic area. So, loosening of uh, joints because they do not integrate with the uh, surrounding tissues. Infection, biofilm formation, this is a very serious problem uh, because of uh, poor sterilization or because of uh, um, practices, bacteria may enter uh, which may get multiplied, it may get attached on the surface of the polymers and lead to biofilm formation, infection, rejection. We studied a lot and uh, the early rejection of biomaterial, the first few days, a week is predominantly because of this uh, biofilm and infection, okay. That is why generally 
um, large amount of antibiotics are given uh, to the patient to prevent uh, bacterial infection and biofilm formation. Okay. Uh, monomer additive leakage, okay, this is also very common, uh, dental uh, acrylic acid leakage is a problem, uh, rest of the body you can have uh, the polymeric uh, um, plasticizers and other uh, material, other material which may be leaking out, so that could be toxic to the person actually like additives. Of course, uh, even metal on metal uh, interaction or wear could uh, lead to um, a release of uh, metal debris, okay, which could be toxic. Sometimes uh, patients have uh, nickel toxicity or uh, cobalt toxicity and so on actually. So that is the metal ion leakage, especially that is a problem uh, in um, artificial knee joints. Okay, so, a lot of uh, issues are there because of which yeah, biomaterial can fail. So, one needs to consider all these aspects okay, <coughs> when you are designing a biomaterial, be it a, a metal, be it a polymer, be it a blend or be it a ceramic. <coughs> and of course, uh, dangerous defective medical devices, faulty surgical instruments, implants, pacemakers, processes and so on. Um, you can have a look at this uh, website. It shows you some real examples of a uh, list of recalls of medical devices by various uh, <coughs> companies uh, because of the faulty designs. It is very interesting to read uh, <coughs> some of these problems. Okay. So, um, FDA also had observed many uh, device failures, uh, recent medical device failures and they have listed them like inadequate sterilization. As you can see, sterilization bacterial infection is the most important. Inadequate sterilization for an orthopedic surgery tool, rust in an injection, ventilators with defective components, infant resuscitators with assembly error. So, if you have multiple parts which needs to be assembled, there could be assembly error. Guide wire with flaking coating. So, we have guide metal guide wires. We may we may coat it with oxides to prevent corrosion, okay. Then uh, th th those could be flaking out. Tracheal tube that kinks, you know, tracheal tube should not kink because if it starts kinking the area, the, the area for the liquid to flow decreases, so the liquid might not flow at all. Unclear labeling, okay, the, that is another problem. If the label is not clear uh, which can lead to a surgeon making a mistake, okay. Either, uh, putting it in the wrong direction or the wrong uh, product. Okay. So, these are some uh, device failures uh, that FDA had uh, observed okay, in their recent okay, and this you can see it from this uh, particular website. Again, it is very, very interesting to have a look at them. Okay. Uh, so, let us conclude on this um, course, the 20 hours uh, course on uh, medical biomaterials. Um, we have had about 40 lectures, uh, we have covered a lot in the past uh, 40 lectures. So, the biomaterial is any substance synthetic or natural or combination of this okay, used for some time or for a very long time inside the human body. It could be a part of the human body, it treats, augments, diagnoses or replaces diagnosis means it could be a biosensor or something or replace any of the tissue okay, or organ or function of the body that is called a biomaterial that is how it has been defined. Of course, a drug is not a biomaterial whereas, if you have a drug delivery system the polymeric system um, which is carrying the drug that is a biomaterial. Okay. So, we have been uh, spending uh, uh, a lot on this particular topic uh, in the past uh, 40 lectures. Okay, so, we looked at metals, polymers, um, synthetic polymers, different types of synthetic polymers, natural polymers, polysaccharides, proteins, then we looked at blends that is polymer, polymer combination. Then we looked at uh, inorganic material ceramics, uh, calcium phosphate, calcium sulphate, okay, uh, alumina, um, then the silicates, glass that is silica glass. Then we looked at composites, combination of uh, carbon reinforced uh, polymers, okay, uh, metal impreg um, 
and the glass impregnated polymers and so on. Okay. So, we looked at large number of these. Then we looked at the morphologies, different types of morphologies. Um, we also had some demonstrations of experiments, how to prepare beads, how to prepare uh, nanoparticles, how to prepare films, how to prepare uh, um, electrospin fabrics, okay, how to prepare uh, polymer gels. So, different morphologies we saw experimentally. Then uh, surface modification um, using a dip coating method, using a, a spinning method, how to modify a polymer surface or a metal surface. Um, so, we can have antibiotic or antibacterial um, material coated on surfaces. So, we, again we looked at it uh, exp um, experimentally as a demonstration. Okay. Uh, so, we look we studied the material and blood interaction, material cell interaction, system uh, response like uh, inflammation, um, okay. a large number of uh, biological functions that take place when a material is uh, implanted into the body. So, we looked at all those as well. Okay. So, uh, this course you can see it is very interdisciplinary. We had uh, problems related to mechanical engineering, problems related to biology and some problems related to polymer chemistry. So, here we worked out a lot of problems. Uh, we had lab demonstration. We looked at fundamental concepts um, um, in mechanical engineering and polymer in biology. We looked at what is this biofilm, inflammation, blood coagulation, etc. Um, then we also studied polymer chemistry. Uh, I spent a few lectures on analytical tools because uh, biomaterials has lot of analytical tools used for looking at the surfaces, looking at the bulk, looking at uh, uh, changes in their chemical properties um, and so on actually. So, a lot of analytical tools are used. So, we looked at them and then uh, we, we spent short time on animal trials, how these animal trials are conducted, what are the issues in animal trials one needs to consider, um, what animals are used for what type of study and so on. So, the whole course has been a combination of uh, engineering, uh, biological science, analytical chemistry. Uh, and uh, polymer chemistry and um, I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, this entire course. Uh, we also had a lot of uh, um, assignments at the end of uh, each week uh, which, was, which was supposed to help you to recap what you studied in that particular week. Um, so, that should have been very beneficial for you and uh, you can always use uh, these video as your future resources as well. So, whenever you have uh, any doubts or you want to refresh certain areas, you can uh, go back to that particular video and have a uh, look at them. And if, of course, uh, we also will be having a final exam uh, where uh, you can uh, test uh, your uh, knowledge and the, your capability uh, based on what you have learned in the past uh, 40 lectures. So, I hope uh, you enjoyed the course and you benefited from the course. Okay? Thank you very much.